But if you're here, you're probably here for a reason, and that's to hear from these two fine gentlemen, Oli Olsen and Ferdinand Frank, uh, from Digital Collections and PPI Media, respectively. And they're here to talk about the challenges in the digital print digital world and how to address them. Interest, interesting to know what we have to talk about now. Um, welcome, everybody. I <coughs> hope you're still uh, awake enough to, to listen to us for 20 minutes we do have, or 25, okay. Yeah, well, um, first hand, I'd like to um, talk a little bit about what we're doing, what the history is, how we get to the point uh, that we can talk about uh, handling content um, like we do as of today. Um, in, the f in, the, in the second part of this uh, presentation, I will hand it over to Ferdinand, and uh, he will show you some more details about this. Because uh, we are two companies, I'm from Digital Collections. My name is Olo Olsen. I'm one of the founders. We started, uh, let me try this, 25 years ago, so such a long time ago. And uh, at that time and point, we had the idea to distribute content in a digital way. At that time, it was 1991. There was no internet available, no nothing, no full text uh, search engines and things like this. So we had to develop that all ourselves. And we ended up with this. This is the current system that we are selling and uh, licensing, which is a central content hub with which you can handle things like we plan to do archive material, text, pictures, graphics, um, what else, video, audio material. And <coughs> today it can also handle RSS feeds, blogs, wires, user-generated content is an archiving system. It has a sophisticated search engine you can do full text retrieval things, and a rights management to, um, to give the information to the editor what he can do with the content, what he's allowed to do with that, a semantic engine with which you can compare content, a workflow engine and a publishing suite, which is the most important thing here today, but I will come to this in detail later on. So at the end of the day, using this central content hub, an editor has access to the news, uh, wires, uh, RSS feeds, whatever, and it also has, he also has access to the archive and he can use this raw content to publish this through different APIs and to the different publication channels like print, like online, social media or syndication purposes. That's basically what we are um, developed so far. And then we had a nice idea, we thought uh, why don't we add we call it, I call this publish, uh, publishing suite an editor to the system so that the editor um, can create a new article directly in the system. So you can select the, the picture or the text or whatever he is interested in and create a new article um, inside the system. And so we ended up with such a construction, for example, at the Ringier um, publishing company, which is the biggest um, Swiss publisher. Uh, where ed editors are using our editor to generate articles which they send into the different publication channels. And these might be various different systems and changing systems. In this case, it's Isenic, it's Drupal, WordPress, Columbus, Woodwing, whatever. Once they decide to go to uh, Amazon Alexa, well, this is just a different channel, but the way they work here remains the same. And uh, the main reason why they, di why they did this, uh, I'm getting confused here, is they wanted to have the opportunity to let one editor write different versions of, of uh, articles within one system. So one article, multiple versions to all channels. Beforehand, they had specific systems for each channel, and uh, the editors refused to do so, and it, they couldn't gain the synergies they wanted to gain. And using the uh, Content Hub, they also gained a lot of uh, synergies by collaborating the articles, the content to different uh, publications. Like for example, in Germany, we do have the Matza Group. This is a publisher of local newspapers. They have 18 different newspapers, and they're using one article about the Formula One race in all these 18 different newspapers, the same article. And uh, if you take a deeper look into some of the Bauer magazines, you will find similar things. But you have to 
dive a little deeper into that. <laughs> How does it look like? The first thing is, uh, if you sit in front of the system, you would like to search for content. Once you have the right content, you might want to go a little bit deeper into this and compare content to find out which one is the right content for you to create a new article. Oh, there's also a screen. And once you have the, uh, the content you really want to use, you can create an article like you see here. You can write the article, you can select the main picture, you can have other pictures for gallery purposes, for online and things like this. And then it's just two clicks away to publish this into the various different production channels. In this case, it's, uh, it's Twitter, it's Facebook, it's print, and it's online. But it can also other channels like WhatsApp or wherever you want to publish this to. Um, because we are outputting the content in standard XML format, and then the channel-specific system analyzes that and yeah, shows it like this. Also, at the early beginning of our time, we had uh, the opportunity to analyze some data from the DPA, from the German press agency. And they had uh, articles which were manually tagged. Like this picture, for example, had a tag on it like it's about sport, kind of sports, Formula One racing. And we came to the idea, maybe we can find out the likelihood of these different words to this tagging scheme. So today we do have about 50 million knowledge fragments, we call this, where it says, for example, the word Vettel has a very high affinity for, to Formula One racing. And so we can recompute this the other way around. So once the system gets such a picture, we can automatically create this information. The interesting point here is uh, you can use this for tagging or for archiving or retrieval and things like this. And we also detect countries, organizations, and persons, a lot of other things. But what we're doing with that is we're comparing content. Even if it's coming from different sources, we could say that uh, this picture from Julia Roberts, for example, if this is interesting for me, we could show automatically what kind of or what articles are published by some uh, other publishers about her or what is available on Flickr or YouTube. And we call this the step from searching to finding. Because we don't have to type in Julia Roberts. And we're just doing suggestions, content suggestions. So this is one, artic one example how to use this. Uh, this is another thing. Um, we can also add, a, add Twitter topics using the semantic analyzation tool, but I don't want to go into details here. Um, today, our semantic engine has about 100 million requests a year. So it's a, high, it's a lot of traffic on this engine. And people are doing a lot of sophisticated things with this. But coming back to the content, once you're creating content using the editor, we are doing this analyzation constantly in the background. This is in German. It's, uh, it says now it's about an epidemic. And uh, these are the mentioned cities and countries. And we can now compare the content that the, art, uh, the editor is just writing with, for example, outside uh, competitors publications. And once you see that, uh, for example, in you know, this, this case it's the Build Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, Guardian, Telegraph, this is automatically displayed once the editor is writing this. So he doesn't have to hoover all these, uh, through all these different sites to find out what the competition is here. And since this article, for example, has been published already, we could also trigger an API and find out how this article performs in the social media. Let's see that he's got 30 uh, likes, 125 links, and 69, uh, we call this uh, comments. comments, right. And so you get a, say, some sort of predictive PI forecast. See, if this thing is really, this theme is really important or interesting right now and well received in social media, and you get an idea if it makes sense to uh, write this article or how performant this will be. Another thing how to use this is uh, in bigger organizations like at Gannett where 7,000 people are working with such a system we can also find out that this is the person who knows best about epi epidemics. Well, you can give her a call and ask her. 
what she thinks about this. And what else? That's it. Yeah, we can do suggestions. And the status quo of our company today is we do have 180 publishers on all five continents. Um, we have some other um, reference sites. But one thing I'd like to mention is the biggest sites uh, we're having today is a publisher who re receives up to 630,000 pictures a day, which is 7.2 pictures a second. Don't ask me how they monitor all this stuff, but it's... It's a real number, that's real life. And the biggest installation today has 60 million assets. Uh, it's Fairfax in Australia, they're having the biggest amount of content. This is something I don't want to show you. And now I'd like to hand it over to Ferdinand, who will talk a little bit more in detail about this area. Thank you very much. So. Thank you, Ole. Yes, so from my side, also welcome. My name is Ferdinand Frank, I'm from PPI Media. We have a very long and prosperous relationship with DC and our uh, editorial solution, Content X. We have more than 30 years of experience in developing software for the publishing sector. Um, some of our references, mainly fr from the newspapers, um, Content X is the integration of DC into print and other, and other channels. So, what is important here, if you work with InDesign, we take the content from DCX and sync it in both directions with InDesign. So, first of all, there has to be a plan. We, we plan newspapers and magazines, not in a flat plan, but this is live production data. So, from here, everyone Who's, who's got access to it, can go into the live InDesign document. And this document is linked to DCX. So every change you do in DCX or in InDesign is synced in both directions. This, of course, kills a lot of errors and a lot of um, multiple data creation. Uh, furthermore, we can, we can distribute it into all kinds of different channels. Our development told me that this uh, was an accident from them for, while developing for Content X. They created an e-paper which is fully responsive, not, uh, doesn't use Flash, so you can work it on any device. And the interesting part about it is you can enhance media inside it. So you, we can put in links, videos, or you can even take your um, ad buyers to the next level and make ads clickable within this e-paper. The last one, interesting one, is um, fully new. It will be launched in two weeks in uh, not far from here in Neubrandenburg. One of our customers uh, created uh, this, this brand called Local Fox. Fox it's um, a local location-based service app that we built for them and they get the content from Content X. So does this all really work? In 2013, we had a customer in Kenya, the Standard Group. They started using Content X, and by the end of 2014, they had so much time that they started doing a second paper, the Nairobian, which is a weekly. The idea of the Nairobian was to tackle a, full new, um, a fully new, um, a fully new, uh, a fully new, uh, well, it's a new newspaper for uh, mainly, he told me it's for women. They left out the politics and uh, left out the, uh, the business sector and put in a bit more gossip. But after uh, two years, it had more circulation than the original standard one. So this is, the system can give you the possibility to, uh, to do a lot more with the, your actual workforce if you let them, simply by automation. So, and 
We have a booth over there. We are all there. And uh, my colleagues are there as well. One of them is attractive and smart. The other one not. Please find out. Thank you for listening.